I'll take your seven minutes. Okay. okay. Ravini Saved, thank you for being here. Um, would one of you please start by um, introducing yourself and describing yourself today? I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Isabel Martinez. I identify as a Chicana artist and art educator. My name is Ruby Chacon. I self-identify as a Chicana artist, muralist, and educator as well. Thank you both for being here. Um, you're both in front of something that you've worked on for the last year or two together now. Um, can you share the title of the mural behind you with us? The title of the mural is um, Sacramento Poderosas. And... I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Can you tell us a little bit about the mural? Um, like how we came to it? How did you come to it? When did you start it? Okay. I I'll speak on that. Um, so. I think it was January of last year, 2022, at approximately, I don't know what time, but um, Rhonda um, had contacted me in regards to um, wanting me to be a part of a project, and then we did a Zoom meeting with the committee, which was yourself, Cristobal, Jose, Vanessa, right, and uh, Rhonda, I think that, that was, it was in the meeting, and they told me about this project about highlighting um, women activists, Latina activists that are local and are still living and um, in order to bring their work um, visible. And so, um, so you, know, um, you know, the stuff that's missing in our curriculums in the schools that people, like people need to know the stuff that they do on a daily basis because it's really important work. And of course, they didn't have a lot of convincing to, to do for me because that's kind of what I do anyways, is like I like to, I, I like to, um, wh when you look at a lot of my work, I rarely do a lot of famous people. I do some once in a great while, but it's always your everyday people who, um, for the most part, the majority, I'm not saying I don't do famous people, but for the most part, it's your everyday people who, um, um, who do all these incredible things and um, we walk past and don't n learn about. And so um, I think that's really important. So um, that's how, that's kind of how I got introduced to the project. And then I asked them, I have this friend who's also an artist that I'd like to bring onto the project. And at, in the beginning, um, Rhonda had a student she wanted me to work with. Um, so I'm like, yeah, sure, I can work with your student. Can I bring on this friend of mine? Cause she's, you know, I would like to work with her. Um, I met her in the credential program, and she's an artist as well. And um, so, she um, she's like sure. And I, I think there was a little like she they, nobody knew Isabel, but I think in the end everybody was so grateful that she came onto the project because she really added a lot to it. Um, Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, and she um, Ruby talked about the project to me and kind of explained. Um, you know, what it was going to be about, and I was really intrigued by that. So, and I've never painted a mural before, so I thought it would just be a great opportunity to learn from Ruby, and just knowing that she's been a muralist for 20 plus years, <laughs> you know, so I, I thought it would just be an awesome moment for me to actually, like, learn from her, and so I was kind of happy at the same time that I'd never been able to do that before because learning from her would have been like, you know, more powerful, I think. Yeah. And of course we learn that we learn from each other, right? <laughs> so, and that's, that's just the way it goes in collaboration here. It's never, it's never something where <clears throat> one person is um, completely the mentor. I think it goes, it's reciprocal. We kind of we kind of learn a little bit from each other. So Isabel has a lot of strengths that she doesn't acknowledge, but I think she has a lot of strengths. <laughs> well, I see you as a mentor, a friend, a Thank colleague. You. So it's, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I learn a lot from you. And then you do tell me, she does tell me this, and she encourages me to kind of like step out of my comfort zones when it comes to art and um, 
just what we share about teaching. And so um, I'm trying to be more accepting of like what I have to offer too. So I appreciate Ruby for that. Thank you. <laughs> Which is a lot. She has a lot to offer. Okay. So this was not your first mural, Ruby. Mm -mm. Um, how is this mural different? Um, from all the other from mural all the projects. Other um, so I've done so many different murals working with a variety of different kinds of people in a variety of different contexts. Um, I think the way that this, what made this one different is that the people that were pushing this more mural forward, um, the idea, the concept of this mural, um, really had a strong sense of community and they had a strong sense of um, uh, changing your community through positive activism and um, and so I, I, I feel like when we came on to start doing this project not only were were like we, we were doing designs and we were looking for really honest and critiques but there were <laughs> and but in the process a lot of times um, many people on the committee were like oh it looks so great and then Isabella and I would be talking like, they're not giving us any feet, any like, <laughs> they're not saying anything negative. Like, cause usually in the process, like you work with people and it's like, can you change this? Or you, can you change that? Or like, can you add this? Or you can, but, every, but it was like, we were all on the same. And I, I think it's maybe because we were all on the same wavelength as well. But, um, but it was, it was such a, an enriching experience. And I was trying to tell Isabel, don't expect all our pro your projects, your mural projects, to be like this because it's not always going to be. A lot of times you have to, um, you know, play the politics with people because you don't know who you're working with a lot of times, and um, and so yeah, that's how I think that's how it's been different because um, I think we're all on the same page as far as like how important this project was, and so um, it was very community oriented, collaborative. Um, very supportive, very loving. It's the most loving project I've ever been on. So I really just feel really um, blessed to be part of this project. Well, we're so blessed that you accepted to be part of this project. Um, Isabel, can you tell us about the symbols on the mural? Like, where do they come from? Ruby shared with us about the collaboration. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I think that some of the some of the symbols like we um, came up with like in our design process, but also we wanted um, the poderosas on the mural um, to talk about the symbols that were important to them, and so we also um, incorporated some of those symbols that they resonated with. So, and then we kind of with that process realized that we share a lot of symbols that are important to us. And so in different ways, maybe, or in similar ways as well, but um, like the butterfly, for example, like that was, um, that came up in, in our design process before, I think before we got feedback from the Poderosas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, we kind of started um, working on the design kind of together but like on different pieces of paper you know so and then um we you know we kind of combined those two ideas together yeah and what about the committee um did they relate to some of the symbols that you had already chosen did they suggest any um, let's see, I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, so the, I know that um, there was I, one particular part, one, one symbol that I, that I remember was um, the capital, the state capital. Um, and we were trying to figure out as a committee, how do you fit the capital in such an organic design? Um, because it was, I, I, the, the person wanted to really um, recognize that sense of place and that this is this is Sacramento, um, the work that's being done in Sacramento, and so um, with through a lot of brainstorming, um, 
I don't know if it was your idea. Was it your idea? But somebody's idea was to, to put it in, um, on the cover of a book. And then, um, and then we came up and it evolved to be, we titled the book Sacramento Her Stories um, and with the capital because the, um, the, the design was already really rich and full and, it, and to put a capital in the background that which is so geometric, um, it probably would have like aesthetically wouldn't have worked, but we were able to like come up as a committee as, to resolve that to put it into the book, that, that are books that are in there. I remember that story, and I do remember like just the different conversations around how you fit it in, and then of course um, it looks perfect. I'm looking at it from here. Um, but Isabel, so if you want to take a look over there, um, can you talk to me a little bit about what what is there next to the Sacramento her story? It's on a book, and then it's located. Um, that book is placed on other books. Yeah. So the. The book is um, sits on top of books that are all different shades of brown, representing the um, you know differences in, in people in Latinx community. So, um, and not just that, you also see the books have um, names of women authors, and so throughout the mural, we also um, placed other other books that kind of represented different flags of Latin America. And um, again, with the authors of uh, women's names, yeah. Latina authors. Yes. <laughs> and Chicana authors, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, would any of you like to talk about another symbol? I know that you're not facing the mural, but mm -hmm. um, that you wanted to put on the mural. Well, a lot, so... Um, so one of the things that I think that needs to be talked about is the, the photo shoot. We had a photo shoot with, with the women, different sessions of photo shoots, depending on when they could make it. And I just kind of gave them prompts on um, like looking at different artwork, different ways you can make gestures, what represents you. And I also asked if they can bring artifacts and stuff like that, that represented them. So those are also kind of symbols. Like Maricela has her graduation cap that says, um, what does it say again? <laughs> Oh, ask for my papers and I will show you my diploma. So that was, that's actually, that's a big sim, um, symbolic statement as well. Um, so she brought that and Mama Cobb also, you know, came in her um, danza attire, um, her regalia. And, um, and so all of that is represented those women. But then um, um, the... The other things that, is, that we did is after the photo shoot, um, we asked the women what are, you know, that, who didn't bring anything that represented, well also, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. MBA wore her t-shirt and she wanted that um, to be a part of it. The C, the California, what does it stand for again? Um, CFA, the union? Um, California teacher Faculty. Union. Association. Yeah. yeah. Um, so she wanted. That's also a symbol. Alma wore her Brown Issues T-shirt. Um, she's part of Brown Issues. So all, all of that really represents the women. But then, in addition to the stuff that they that weren't in the mural or that they didn't wear or bring, um, we also um, we asked them some of the things that they could that represented them. And so, um, Dr. Uh, Flores um, talked about the Tamaya. Yeah, Maya. Yamaya, Yamaya, um, the Yamaya, and we had, of course, in all these murals projects, I always have to learn different things too. So I didn't know much about it, and so we looked at it, looked at the images of it, and a lot of it has water representation. So we did a lot of water around um, Dr. Um, Flores, and then um, a lot of people brought up the hummingbird, which I also love, anyways. Like the hummingbird is something that I I feel represents joy. Um, and I've actually had specific um, times when I've been painting and I've been feeling, you know, down or like blocked or what have you. And I've had a hummingbird fly up and just like take me out of that. You know, anytime I see a hummingbird, it kind of feels like a sign of like, you're on the right path and this is, you know. So I love the hummingbird and I love that a lot of women suggested it. And I'm sure it means a little bit, something a little different to each woman. But for me, it was, it represents joy. Um, and Yaya in particular, um, requested a lot of different symbols to represent her. Um, not only like the, the way we painted her, like she's a, she's a performer. So like 
we try to paint her in that mannerism of um, movement. And then also she's working on this play about the missing daughters, um, uh, Native American missing daughters that um, go and missing and aren't looked for. And then that symbol of the hand over the mouth um, that represents that whole activist um, portion of that and awareness. Um, so we included that um, as well as like her dress, the dress that she came in. Um, she wanted it to be um, in the colors of the pride flag. So we changed the colors of her dress into the, um, to the pride flag, um, as well as um, the feathers and um, <laughs> I'm losing the, the, the thing. The sage? Or what? What is that called again? She's a, she's also perform. She's a danzante too. So um, where she's carrying the copal and it come the I forgot what that's called. I'm sorry, but that all of that she sent me actual pictures of some of the things symbols that represented her. So I just added those after, um, and then also like she had something that said something about trans rights. And so we, you know, the tree um, when this when the um, we did the photo shoot. Um, there was an image that I actually had done for Malks that the women um, gravitated towards, and it was a women that were kind of like in, um, that were um, embedded into the tree as kind of like a tree of knowledge and pulling up the little girl, like women giving back knowledge. And so the tree, because you know, makes paper, and so like we use that paper to kind of flow up, and um, and so that's where we put in trans protect trans people. Um, and um, and that's also why the tree's in there because the women a lot of a lot of the photo shoot was them trying to recreate this tree, and um, and then the butterflies um, were supposed to be part like the leaves, but they're also very pow powerful. Um, not only the leaves of the tree, but they're a powerful symbol of resilience, immigration, and that whole story of them migrating from Michoacan to Canada and back, and how some of them don't make it along the way, and it's just like acknowledging how the struggles of people who come and migrate here and, um, and, and the strengths of the people that migrate here and what they bring. So the, I mean, so there are so many layers to a lot of the symbols that are in there. Um, and the last thing that I think is really, that I, I feel is really powerful was the rose out of the concrete. Um, um, Dr. MBA being an educator and um, the symbolism of what that means of um, being in, and especially both of us were in um, Title I schools um, and, um, and you know, in Title I schools, we um, have le have less resource, but in and our students have less resource. But in the, in the midst of all that, they still are able to thrive like the rose out of the concrete. So, um, so that was really for me was really powerful too. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah. So I, that's what I can recall of the symbol. So it was kind of I when I'm saying the stories, I think it was. A, a very collective and collaborative effort with them telling us and us also bringing our own um, experiences to it and then just coming together like that. What do you think? <laughs> Anything to add? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, I think about the, the cactus a lot because um, that's something that I use like a lot in my own work. Um, and I've kind of always kind of gone back to like the symbol of the cactus or the nopal. Um, and then for me, it just kind of a lot of, um, you know, resonates with like my childhood in general, uh, growing up on a farm, you know, always having the cactus, but not just that, just um, going back to Mexico to visit my family and just seeing like this native plant that is part of our um that is native to this land or to our land. So, and then just has a lot of different meanings to me as well. Like my mom cooks nopales and we eat it. We eat the tunas, um, the prickly pears um, off the nopal as well. And so it just offers a lot of nutrients as well. Um, and not just that, it survives in very harsh conditions and it grows in harsh conditions. So. Um, I think about that and just the reference to that and, and people and, and people in our community and how we are resilient and we, mm -hmm. um, we persevere through hardships. So mm -hmm. think about that a lot too. And there was the, 
Also the stole that um, Maricela is wearing. And um, originally her stole does have, you know, she cre I think I remember hearing she made the stole, um, but it did not have the sarape piece that's at, at the end. So we added that. Um, and so that is something that um, is important to me as well. Uh, just, I had a sarape piece on my stole, you know, when I graduated. And so that kind of representing like our first generation, and for me, um, being a first generation college student um, and just being, just seeing like how I was the only, I'm the only one so far out of all my siblings and I'm number five out of six. And just, um, you know, kind of realizing that my siblings had a hard time getting through that educational system. And so how important that is for me to, to be able to do that, but also share my knowledge with my family as well. Yeah. We have that in common. I'm number five out of six in first <laughs> generation too, and only. Yeah, that's interesting. That was one of the things we bonded about. Yeah. <laughs> getting to know each other. Speaking of getting to know each other, how did you get to know each other? Well, we met in the uh, teaching credential program at Sac State. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, <laughs> we I was going to say, I was and, say uh, it was love at first love sight. At first sight. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, so we just, we were in the same cohort as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so like all, all this, all the stuff that you go through in the credential program uh, and, and also being um, one of four uh, artists, art, art credential. Yeah. Yes. teachers like we were mm -hmm. always in the same groups and um, always working together studying together also we carpooled back and forth together um, throughout the credential program. and when I first started the credential program I, I had um, committed earlier I had been commuting on my bike um, for the past 10 years but then I like okay I don't know if I can do my home have time to do my homework and commute on bike and so Isabel would um in the beginning would offer me rides. And then when I got a car, we just started carpooling back and forth. Um, so we really got to know each other and we really worked well together. And this, throughout this whole time we've known each other, we've always just, we've always just been done really well working together. We, even over the pandemic, we'd all meet and do lesson planning on Fridays and just always, always have worked together um, really well and just kept in touch the whole time. Yeah. And I think that was like really important for me because I remember during the credential program, our professors would tell us like, uh, y'all are probably gonna stay friends for a long time. And so like, I felt like I wanted to make that happen and not just us two, but our other friends from our cohort. And um, yeah, so we just kind of really got to know each other really well during that time because mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we probably saw each other like, or I, I cried for sure. <laughs> I remember it was pretty tough. Um, but we saw each other and just like all these different kind of emotions, right? Cause it was just, it was tough, um, a tough program and just being so busy, student teaching, but also studying and just, so like you really get to know someone that way when you're going through that mm -hmm. together. Yeah. And just spending a lot of time together as well. Yeah. What year did you two finish your credential program? In 2019. Mm -hmm. So you both went to teaching right after that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we both went into teaching right after. And then within our first year, the spring of our first year, we went into lockdown, you know, because yeah. of the pandemic and, and went into distance learning and... So that's what Ruby was saying, like during distance learning, you know, we teaching at different schools, but we would still make time yeah. um, to meet over Zoom to plan lessons because um, we had to just rearrange everything, mm -hmm. right? We couldn't teach the same way that we taught in the classroom, especially teaching art. Like, yeah. And with our students not <laughs> yeah. having the supplies. Yeah. Yeah. We not having creative. supplies and just... Um, you know, it was just a, a whole different thing that we were having to adapt to. 
Yeah. So it was really um, necessary for us to meet and um, plan lessons together so we could, but also vent to each other yeah. and support each other emotionally because it was a really tough time. And yeah, so. So this was a piece of cake working together compared to everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we survived that, we could do this together. Yeah. And we're, we're go going to be working together next year too at Woodland together. So finally, I'm going to go to the same school as her. I'm moving from my school to Woodland, and um, we'll be working again together. So we, we already know we work well together. So, yeah, yeah. And she'll be more. <laughs> she'll be my. She'll be my boss. Yeah, I'll have to show Ruby the ropes and just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's it's cool. It's all good. Yeah. I look forward to it. You guys switched on me. We did. <laughs> yeah. In your shirt. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, your experiences as teachers going through the pandemic because I think that that's. Mm -hmm. Something we hear a lot about, but I particularly don't know, um, especially like for a first year teacher who's um, Chicana, maybe you can talk a little bit about what that means to you and how you saw your teaching um, through the pandemic um, mm -hmm. and how you had to adjust to being a teacher, but also what does that mean, right? Um, mm -hmm. when you're going through a global pandemic, like what were your students going through? Mm -hmm. How were you able to... Um, draw from your own lived experiences to best support your students? That's a good question. Do you want to go first? Or you want me? Uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so in, during the pandemic, you definitely noticed the inequities in um, the school system and, and within our communities. Um, you, our students, we had to be mindful that our students didn't don't have the supplies to um, or and they you know we can't expect them to buy them because they're like I learned that a lot of them might be there might be 10 people in like a one bedroom two bedroom apartment and it's and like to and I noticed like being on zoom like they'd have to mute themselves because it would be really loud um, and then like um, we would so the uh, other art teacher what we had then, and I um, put together a bunch of art kits, and I, the, on, there was another layer of like going to their houses and delivering some of them to those who couldn't make it to the school to pick it up, and learning the, just, just um, you know, just the humble means that a lot of the students were coming from, and um, and um, the. And then just teaching, like the first time, like they didn't know how to do emails yet because they didn't, none of our students had laptops, you know, they didn't, this is their first time trying to log on, like teaching them how to log on, just the basic stuff, logging on to Zoom, um, showing them how to do an email, showing them just the little steps of a computer and trying to do lessons that, um, you'd have to just scaffold a lot of the lessons using the technology, how to use these different programs so they could upload things or like just different things like that. Um, you had to teach them step by step. And then in addition to having um, majority ELs in, in my classes, um, there's another barrier there, not only with the um, inequities of like my students not having the same thing, it's the same, um, resources that other students might have. Um, they all, there was also the language barrier. Um, and so um, it was just, it was a lot. It was a lot to try to figure out, but it also, I think it made, it made me a better teacher and it probably made you a better teacher. I think it made us uh, um, just, just recognize. And I, I think also that um, for a short term, districts were realizing um, uh, the, that um, are the challenges that our students were facing just through this pandemic. And um, I just hope that they don't, because a lot of times people forget, and I hope that that's something that people don't forget, that, you know, we, we just, you just have to do more for the students because they, they don't come from, 
they don't come from privileged families, and so they're not going to have the same. Um, but at the same time, they're survivors and they persevere still. So. Yeah, I I, I was thinking while you know Ruby was was saying all those things. Another piece was like the social emotional piece of the students, and I and I mm -hmm. and it really made me like think like, oh wow, if I'm feeling this way, like if I'm feeling like sometimes I don't know what to do with myself or just just the way that we all were kind of experiencing being stuck at home and just all this stress, I was like, I can't imagine what they are feeling and they're still developing, they're still, you know, they're they're missing out. They know they're missing out on all these experiences that mm -hmm. they would have normally been able to do and we were just not able to do. And so it was hard and it was like also- Like graduation even. Yeah, know? like graduation, just other, just milestones that mm -hmm. they didn't get to have because of that. Um, and so I think that was one of the other things that we, when we would plan together, we're like, how could we like uh, do more check-ins or just, um, it was definitely more about like social emotional mm -hmm. teaching That's true. more than anything else. It's like how can we like make more opportunities for students to be able to kind of um, express the way that they're feeling, um, whether it was like verbally or through their artwork or, um, but it was, it was just like, let's just less about like the traditional part of teaching and more about that. And um, yeah, so I think that that really like made me understand them a little bit better um, but just also the things that we probably didn't know that they were experiencing. And like a lot were, a lot of the students, um, because they're high school students had to also help their younger siblings, yeah. you know, do distance learning. And so they just, they did not have a lot of time to really, um, focus on their own work and be present in class even sometimes. So That's true. we were losing a lot of students too. So attendance was really, really low at that time as well. Yeah. And then even the other layer is coming back to school and how they were, how they um, hadn't, they had to socialize themselves. We had, they had to re-socialize to come back to the classroom um, because they were used to just like getting getting up and just if they like Isabel said um you know if they had to take care of a sibling or if they had to go do something they you know just leave the zoom meeting like they that that whole um habit routine kind of came back into the classroom where they could just would just leave thought that they could just leave right away or whenever they wanted or um, and so they had to be acclimated again to the classroom. And um, that was a lot, that was a big challenge. And a, a lot of teachers that year left. So um, left, the, left the career, um, but it's starting to get back into the norm, but um, I don't actually know if the norm is even good enough. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> we're just kind of, after the pen or after coming back to in-person teaching, kind of just being, forced into just going back to the way it was. And it's like, we, we couldn't do that, but we were, but we were expected to do that. And mm -hmm. I think that we're still feeling the effects of that. And it, it was yeah. hard because they expected us to, to police students with the masks. And at my mm -hmm. school in particular, we had a middle school, high school split and it was split. We were used to be one campus with middle school, high school, and then they split it with colors, middle school being blue, high school being red and we, and, uh, high school wasn't supposed to go on the blue. It was like this kind of division segregation, which was like, I'm not, I'm just like, I'm not going to police. I'm sorry. I'm not going to police students to not go on the middle school side. <laughs> I just, that's just too much. Like to, to do the mask, police them to do this, police them to do that. And I'm just like, they're just coming back. And, um, I just, I, I just felt like it was way too much for them too, for us and for them, for all of us. Mm -hmm. How, um, what is the role of art, you think, in like your students' lives right now coming back from the pandemic? Um, 
I think that it continues to be that social emotional piece, um, but particularly with me and my students, I feel like the the projects that I that I try to create or encourage for them are largely based in identity, are mm -hmm. based in like, uh, you know how basically helping them kind of express different parts of their identity um, and and I think that all the projects kind of go back to that so instead of like we're copying you know one thing it's like how can you make this your own with your own experiences um, so I think that that's mainly how I structure projects I think similar to Isabel, I do the same thing. Um, also, um, you know, I was doing a lot of check-ins, a lot of, even try to do some breathing until they kind of got tired of it. <laughs> and then, then check-in, just check-ins. And then um, before we did, the, actually did the art, always focused on them. The artwork always focused on them and then focusing on artists that um, reflect them. I, so... <laughs> We were just talking about your parents. Um, familia is something that's really important to myself and to both of you. Um, do any of you want to begin by introducing maybe your family? How you grew up, who you grew up with? Would you like to start? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, so both of my parents are um, Mexican and um, my uh, dad, he uh, grew up in, in Chihuahua, Mexico, and uh, he migrated to the U.S. when he was 18 years old. Um, and he specifically came to look for work and do uh, temporary work and uh, bring, you know, make some money, bring it back home to his family. Um, and then uh, my mom, she came when she was 10, so she grew up in in um, Colima, Mexico, and uh, so she and her family migrated when when she was 10 years old, and um, so she did go to public school in the U.S. and they um, they lived in Vallejo, California, and um, she. She talks about how hard her her experience in school was. Um, she didn't speak, you know, she didn't speak any English, and she talks about how there was no resources for her at school. Nobody spoke Spanish. There wasn't like a bilingual assistant or um, specialist that could help her, and so she really just had to kind of figure it out on her own. Um, and when she got to high school, um, you know, her language was a little bit better, but still struggling. And um, just being the youngest out of 16 children, she was, wow. yeah, she was, um, you know, her, her older siblings, her brothers, um, you know, kind of treated her as like their own daughter. And so they were very strict on her as well. And around that time is when she met my dad. <laughs> So she met him through one of her uh, friends who was his cousin. And um, just being in a very kind of machismo type of household, mm -hmm. when my dad was coming around to try to date her, they her brothers took that as like, oh, you're ready to marry, and kind of forced her to quit school. Mm -hmm. And I um, think she was around 16 years old. Um, so she dropped out of high school and, and you know, her and my dad uh, got together and they had um, my brother, my their first child, 16, 17 years old, and my dad was like 18. So they were very young parents and, and um, I think them having to like, you know, they weren't grown up themselves I think my dad, in some sense, had to mature, you know, a lot faster just with his experience. But um, my mom was, you know, just kind of, kind of being forced to, to leave her home. Mm -hmm. um, they were having to like 
learn about parenting on their own and just kind of, so they, they, they had to, um, or the way that they parented was kind of like, they knew what they didn't like about the way their parents parented them, but, um, but they also had like all of that trauma with them still. So it was, <laughs> it was a lot for them, but, um, I grew up in Pancrope, California. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm. My dad um, worked there, and so we were, he was able to, you know, we were able to rent that, there because he worked on the farm. Um, though when I was growing up, it was not operating anymore. So it was just really a, a farm. The owners kept cows there, but uh, the farm or the dairy farm itself wasn't really producing anything. Um, so. Um, it was, I mean, it was a great place to be in the sense that it was like a lot of outdoor space. Um, but just being one of six children and both of my parents working all the time, we were just kind of, um, left alone a lot and just, you know, they weren't around a lot because they were having to work. They had to work. Um, I don't know what else. <laughs> I'm kind yeah, of stuck on like your mom. What did it mean for you to work on a project that was mm -hmm. going to be centered on women? Mm -hmm. Well, I think about my mom a lot because um, she. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I can't. No. <laughs> you know, my mom. Sometimes we have to live out their dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want me to get this? Okay. Um, um, as I'm talking, I'm thinking about Isabel's story and Isabel. So, anyways, okay, so um, I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, and my, um, I grew up, my mom was a single mom. Um, my dad, um, I'm one of six kids, too. I'm number five as well. Um, and I did not know my dad's story until much later. I healed, we healed our relationship when I was an adult, but I learned about his educational experience um, later. My mom, I, I knew a lot about her because she would tell us stories all the time. She was the youngest in her family. And um, my grandma was born in 1899 and my mom was born in 1940. My mom was born in, in Salt Lake City. My dad was born in Monticello, Utah. But my grandparents were born in New Mexico. Um, none of them spoke English. Um, my grandma did not speak English. And so my mom was pretty much, um, she was the one that was kept home. Um, she was taken out of school and kept home. Um, she went, she learned English until this, uh, in school and then um, took taken out of school when she was in second grade um, to take care of the family and to tr you know to take my grandma do uh, translate for her do things for her take care of the household so my mom didn't really get the educational experience that my dad did but my but um, I see the differences between them in the sense that um, my mom doesn't have as much internalized racism that um, my dad does. My dad, I found out later that was, um, they were segregated in the schools, so um, they couldn't, they couldn't um, ride the buses with white students, they couldn't um, drink from the same fountains, they couldn't, um, um, they had to sit in the back of the class, um, and um, they were hit for speaking Spanish. If they ever spoke Spanish, they would get hit by the teachers, and the teachers would just say racist things all the time. And, um, so um, when I talk to my elders, my aunts and my uncles, I learn a lot from them um, in regards to how um, difficult it was even to graduate high school um, because of the treatment, the harsh treatment in the schools. And um, so that's where the language kind of um, uh, was pushed out of my um, family. I'm sorry. I wonder if that's my car. Should I go look? Yeah.
think as women we no, it's not really, it's derive not. like okay. educational opportunities specifically we're thinking of and how what that means for us when we do pursue that. Like um, I think of the work of Jerry Bayo, who talks about regalos, like how it's like that mm -hmm. regalos have a diploma, but it's also like this carga that you carry because you know that you are in a position to pursue that and that has a like a responsibility with it, right? It's not just like my choice. Mm -hmm. So thanks mm. for Oh come on, Car. <laughs> Where is it? Was, in the, it's in the apartments. And those mm -hmm. birds, I was like, oh, <laughs> somebody shut the birds. Up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I think it'll be fine. Um, With the car in the back? Oh no, no, not the car. We got oh. the car. Oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> the birds. <laughs> yeah, the birds were just. I went out there and they were just. I, I had a hard time telling my story because I was worried about Isabel the whole time. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we can maybe talk about. Um, do we want to do we want to talk about the legacy of racism in schools because I think that's something I still want to I still want to talk about it I just was distracted yeah like I just felt distracted mm -hmm. yeah do you want to talk about you want to do you want to restart I can finish it we're talking about your father's story yeah going through schools yeah so your father was born in Utah and went to school in Utah. So my father was born in Monticello, Utah. Um, my grandfather had come to Utah um, as, as a young, as a boy um, with his dad, sheep herding. And so um, he was, I mean, he was left, he was in the sheep camps when he was like just a little boy by himself, you know, sheep herding. And so, um, but uh, my dad, so, um, so none of the, none of my grandparents went to school. Um, my grandma on my mom's side, my, my maternal grandma, um, was, um, uh, was given away when she was 13. She had an arranged marriage um, when she was 13 to somebody who was like 30. And so um, she was, the, so none of them had the opportunity for school, um, those old traditions. And then um, my mom was kept home, um, taken out of school when she was in second grade. Um, to help with the family. She was the youngest, so she was there to, he to help with household chores and everything like that. Well, my dad, um, they, th and, and he's the only one that really got the educational experience. He didn't, he didn't, I don't know what grade he went to. I don't, he didn't make it through high school or anything. I don't know what grade he went through because I didn't really get a chance to ask, I haven't asked that, um, but, um, but I know that they were segregated in the schools and they were um, not permitted to um, drink from the same fountains. They had to sit in the back of the class and they were hit for speaking Spanish, weren't allowed to ride the buses. Um, uh, when they were, you know, my aunt remembers working in, like being the first Mexican woman able to um, serve the public before they'd have, they'd make them go through the back and just work in the back. They weren't able to be seen, um, allowed to be seen. and. Um, and so a lot of the differences that I noticed um, from my mom to my dad, um, because my dad and I, even though he was there when I was really little and then he was gone, so my mom was pretty much a single mom, but what I learned from him later as I, um, we healed our relationship and I started asking questions to my aunts and uncles and their experience because I didn't know this stuff until much, much later in my life. And um, I... Uh, I learned that he, he, there was a lot more internalized oppression and racism that he had carried from the schools. And my mom didn't experience the school system, so she still felt proud to be Chicana. She always was proud about who we were. and as, She didn't know a lot about the history, but she was proud about the identity. And she still spoke Spanish, and my dad, and I asked my mom one time, why did you not speak to us in Spanish? Because um, my grandma actually didn't speak, my grandparents didn't speak, um, my grandma didn't speak English, but she died when she was, um, when I was six months old. Um, she was actually hit by a car um, from a drunk driver in the neighborhood. She was walking and he hit her and she died. And um, it was a, they, I was told that it was a white man and my mom said the hardest thing is that he was put in jail for the night and then was driving around the neighborhood the next day. So um, a lot of those things, I think what, how my mom carried 
the stories and how my dad carried, how my dad uh, responded to what their experiences were a little different. My mom, um, I asked her why we did, she didn't teach us Spanish or why she didn't talk to us in Spanish. And she said, because my dad insisted that we only speak English. And, um, and I could understand, I didn't understand that until much later when I learned about his experience in school and um, how a lot of times um, they wanted us to thrive in school in the next generations and not be discriminated against for the language barrier. And, um, but that actually did not happen. <laughs> so even though the intentions were good, um, it, it made it a lot more difficult because I remember I had to l pick up Spanish later in life, but growing up, um, I, I knew my maternal grandfather, both my maternal and mater paternal grandfather, and my mater my they both spoke English but were Spanish dominant. And as they got older, they became just um, Spanish dominant, mostly Spanish. And I remember being a teenager, um, being in my um, grandfather's um, home. We'd go visit every Sunday, and he would try to speak to us, but he couldn't speak to us in English because he had lost his ability to speak English because of the um, he'd had a, a few strokes and lost that ability to speak any English. And so um, he would just, he would just start, sorry. <laughs> he would just cry, you know, and it, and it was just so powerful to see a grown man cry. But I didn't really realize the impact that had on him until I was an adult. And I would start, I wanted to know where I came from. So I went to ask my family on my dad's side because I had more access to my dad's side of the family. And I went to talk to my grandfather and him, he was speaking to me in Spanish and I would just look at it like, I remember I felt the same way my grandfather felt because I couldn't, especially in elders Spanish as they, you know, age. It's, um, and then also it's the old Spanish. It's, you know, um, the Spanish that, like, when the colonizers came, you know, it's not Spanish from Mexico. It's Spanish when the colonizers came. It's that old Spanish. And um, I had a hard time picking up everything he was saying, and I just remember just bawling at night because I couldn't... Um, I couldn't communicate with my grandfather. And I just reflected back on my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, and how what it must have been like for him not to be able to communicate with his own grandchildren. And so the damage that I think that did to all of us. Um, and I think that's why art and images are so important um, to me, because um, uh, you don't need to speak a certain language or have a, a certain educational level to access them, and especially murals, because they're for the community. And it's, um, and I can go into the first art show I ever had when my, um, I started painting the stories of my, um, my, the stories that I learned about my dad's side of the family, and I had my first art show with them, and this is when I started to like heal with my dad and he had come in before everybody had arrived and he saw his dad on the, the gallery wall and he was like in front of Blue Mountain where he sheep herded and my dad started, I could see my dad, his eyes started to well up and um, he's like, I used to sheep herd with my dad there and just tell me stories and and my dad doesn't talk or tell stories or hug or say, I love you. And, and it, it was the first time that I got to experience a little bit of him and his voice through these, through these pictures and then, um, or these paintings. And other people would say, I know you're painting about your culture, but this is, the, I feel like that's like my dad, you know? And, and so um, I realized the power of, telling stories through your artwork and how that can heal not only yourself, but it can heal other people just to have the, just to have that visibility of people who are suppressed in the schools, whose stories aren't told and who, why I didn't even know my dad's 
the experience of my dad's story. I heard, I le grew up learning about the Mormon pioneers and the struggles they had. I didn't learn about the Mexican American experience. I didn't learn about that until I got older and I got to ask those stories. And so um, it, this is an opportunity to fill in those gaps. Um, and I can go on and on, but <laughs> there's more to it, but. I think when you take um, a position like teaching, where you're going to be interfacing like young people who are just learning about who they are as a person and then as a part of a community, part of a of people that have, you know, I, I use this term, um, this native scholar uses, have been surviving, mm -hmm. but also like survivance because they've been thriving like, throughout all of the challenges. So. Um, thank you for sharing your, your story. I think that everybody has their own version of you know, their family history, but I agree that symbols are a way to, to connect together about these stories. Um, Isabel, do you want to say anything about your father um, or anything else about your mother? I know that you've, you've shared a lot of, of of your mother um, with me, and I don't really want to right now, but you know. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I think that um, her her experience was was very different. And so um, growing up, you know, compared to other friends who whose both parents were, you know, newly newcomers from Mexico, you know. Um, I, I, I saw my mom as like, um, in, in a different way, I guess, cause she, um, she was working, you know, she was always working when we were younger and she held, uh, positions like being a secretary in an office, some type of office. Um, and she spoke fluent English and she also spoke Spanish. Um, so <clears throat> to me, being able to like see her in in those kind of positions was um, in a way kind of like helped me see that you know those jobs could be obtainable to me too. But at the same time, being at school, like I, I wasn't really feeling confident at all. Um, I hated elementary school. <laughs> um, Elementary school was not fun because it was just um, being one of the very few um, people of color at the school, um, and not being not seeing like my um, culture being reflected in the curriculum, and just not really like feeling like um, I had a place there. I always felt um, othered or different. And um, so I, you know, I didn't really like have a great time. It wasn't really till later, until I was in high school that um, I really like took hold of like art and kind of just immersed myself in art. And that's really like what, what helped me like um, express myself, but um, also just feel like I had a place like I was okay I was good at something because school had taught me that I really wasn't good at a lot of things um yeah mm -hmm. yeah so you you were strengthened by art and you, you were healed through your art what do you want I'm sorry I'm oh I'm just taking a breath <laughs> I'm taking a sigh <laughs> Yeah. What do you wish your students to feel, think, reflect on when they see you, um, these women, and you in front of the mural telling them about it? I mean, I would, I would want them to see that that things are possible for them, but. Also, at the same time, realize how, you know, this doesn't happen very often for all of us, like reaching positions of 
you know, in higher education, like a lot of these women have. And just myself being a, a teacher, um, well, I think about my students and in the way they are very lucky, specifically at our school, um, to have teachers of color. But I try to tell them, like, it's not like this everywhere. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, t I tell them about my experience. Like, I didn't have um, teachers of color. I had maybe one or two at the whole school. Like, if I'm thinking about high school, and it was the teachers who taught Spanish, you know, so... You know, I tell them, like, I didn't see that a lot growing up. So the fact that you can have that is, is really great. But let's also acknowledge that it's, we still need, we still need more teachers of color and we still need mm -hmm. education to be more, um, more um, reflected of our communities, you know, reflective of our communities, because um, it's not. Yeah, and my and the Mormons used to go on always went on missions. So we had white Spanish teachers. We I never had a I never had a person of color in my K through twelve um, teacher ever. Um, and so, but I had one undergrad person of color, and that was my Chicano experiences class. And then when I went to the SAC credential program, that was the first time I had all these professors of color. I never had anyone that reflected me. So I thought that, I, th I think Isabel's correct with that um, because also what those teachers bring is their own experiences and their own biases. And they're gonna, they're gonna push their own lens on students that know nothing about them. And I think that's part of what I also felt as well that I wasn't good at anything. Um, because I didn't relate to a lot of the stuff that I was learning. I, I didn't see the curriculum ref, reflect, my own experience reflected in the curriculum. Everything that I learned about my own history has been through my own research, later asking my elders, or a, a, mostly in the credential program, <laughs> or through, yeah, I have, or the one Chicano Chicana experience class that I had. And that was actually a, uh, a light bulb that went off when the first time I heard the story of La Llorona in my Chicano Chicano experiences, I thought that class, I thought that was a story that only my mom told that only we experienced and we, she was at the Jordan River in Utah. And I didn't know that was a big Mexican folktale that, but a lot of the stories started to become validated in that one class that I had. And, um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why, um, I mean, it, where school can really oppress you and um, why art is something that can inspire you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, reflecting on your childhood, um, though you weren't represented in the school curriculum, can you think about um, like a moment where you out in your community and your family home, like felt pride in like who you were, like what was going on. The one thing that I had pride growing up in was looking at Lowrider magazine and going to car shows. Um, that was the only thing I saw, only place I saw reflected anything that anything resembled me. Um, you have to remember that I grew up in Utah. I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. We, I, I mean, it was clear minority there. And um, so everything about me was supposed to be bad because everything I saw reflected in the media was like, we were gangsters, we were criminals. Those were the stories that got inside, got inside our, our bodies and our spirits and our minds. And sometimes everyone that was around me embraced those stories, including myself. I mean, I have to say, when I was young, I embraced that, that identity. Um, I didn't really recognize um, the, the assets of my community until much later when I started getting the other stories, the, hit, the more um, historical facts of our stories. Um, but the art in, that goes into lowriders and, um, I, and this, um, 
the creativity that goes into all that I identified with and it, and it was all about I felt like it was about that was something that was about me and my community um, so I really I think that's the only thing that I ever um, felt reflected in my community until I started going out of state not even the people that ran for office there was my um, I have a cousin who was um, like my mom's fir first, my mom's second cousin and my, my third cousin. Um, he was the first Chicano senator um, and he died in um, just before 9-11. And um, he was the only one for the longest time, everyone depended on him. And um, so there was nobody even like, no teachers, um, uh, the one professor, nobody that reflected us whatsoever. And in fact, when I started looking for the stories of my um, my family history, because they I didn't learn them, um, uh, I w so somebody had told me you should speak with Professor Gonzalez because um, you know he, he I just got turned to him. This was after I graduated college. And so I went to talk to him. It turns out he um, grew up with my dad in Monticello. And, um, and he's like, you know who you need to talk to is um, who has a, carries a lot of knowledge of our history is, your, is Cosme Chacon. Well, Cosme Chacon is my grandfather. And so that's when I decided to go see, talk to my grandfather the first, for the first time, was through this professor. And after I did all these paintings about what I had learned, I invited Professor Gonzalez to see him. And he too, um, <laughs> it was so powerful because I saw a grown man like, like my father with tears like welled up. And I, he just told me, he's like, you don't understand Ruby, they thought we were nothing. He's like, to see ourselves on these, uh, on these walls, he's, he just said, well, they thought we were nothing. He's like, but look how beautiful we are. And I knew what I was doing was important. I knew, I knew, I knew that that was my journey and that was my path. Gosh, you don't want to hear. <laughs> that was my calling. I knew it. But I think that your experience of being in Salt Lake City, I mean, there are clear differences between being in California and being in Utah, but still being like majority Mexicano people or Latinx people, you still don't see the teachers. Like, I still went through K to through 12 without mm -hmm. having one teacher of color. So. And that does, really does a number on you. I mean, it really does. I mean, I didn't feel smart. <laughs> I didn't feel what I had to bring was anything. So your, sim your presence, simply just being present in a room and standing in front of a room and speaking to students whose lives you know, can mirror yours in many ways is so powerful but with it also comes an ex intense amount of responsibility and there's a lot of weight that you carry oh definitely do you want to I, talk about that i don't know about you isabel but i know like the reason why i've been burnt out for my probably after my the first couple of years was that sense of responsibility. I felt like the huge burden responsibility for making sure that they had everything they need. Like I saw myself in them. So, and, and I felt like um, if I just, if, I, if one, even one student fails, I'm, I'm failing, you know? I put so much pressure on myself. It took, it's taken me so long to realize I can't be responsible for every single student even though as much as i want to it it really took a toll on my health um 
you know, I started getting thyroid issues. I started getting vertigo. And then I realized, okay, I'm not going to last if I keep this up because of that pressure, you just plan, over plan, overwork, work, you know, my first couple of years, I was working all my, not only was I working at school, I was working my week, my uh, evenings, my weekends. I had, I put all that, I, I just overworked. It's like for, for a couple of years in a row. And then my third year, I started to realize when I started getting the health issues, my third and fourth year, my third year, I started to eat, I still had that habit, but I was trying, being mindful to not to, to, um, being mindful to take care of myself a little bit and try to add that into my schedule. And then this year, I was been really, really firm on not bringing my work home or, because you can't, it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure because you know what those students are, you know, you relate to what a lot of those students are going through. Um, you know, not, I mean, I never had a bedroom until I was a teenager, you know. I didn't have a, my, my dresser drawer was in the, in the hallway, you know, we didn't, we were crowded. You know, every same, the similar experience my students were facing in the pandemic, you know, that was my experience too, like in a really crowded space, not being, I'd have to block myself out to study, you know, now, in fact, that's what I, that's what art did for me is like, I was, I mean, I'm, I can easily block things out because that's how I grew up. I learned to, I learned, to, I learned to, that I can draw, you know, and block all the chaos out and, and make sense of everything in blocking all that stuff out. But, you know, I, I feel those experiences through my students too. And so it's, it's really hard to separate yourself, but to survive this this field, you have to, uh, you know, to a certain degree, you have to. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree a lot with what Ruby's saying. And I think that um, she kind of put a name to it too. And I didn't really think of it like that, but it's like, it is more pressure that we're feeling because, because we understand some of our students' experiences and and then we also know from like our end as the educators who work in this institution. And then we know that sometimes we're like having to place, you know, uh, policies or, or um, expect them to, or expecting to police them a certain way. Um, and we understand that that's not helpful to them or not you know, it's not right. And so we're still like struggling with what we want for our students, but what this institution also wants us to do, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's, it's hard to be in that, in that place for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have, um,